So I get to introduce the final keynote of the morning. And I have to tell you, it's incredibly exciting, and I'm incredibly proud to introduce Heidi Bovere, Dr. Heidi Bovere. I, I actually know her before she was Dr. Heidi, but now she's got a big fancy title, and you'll see why. She is the Assistant Professor of Emerging Media Technology, uh, Technology, specializing in game and interactive media design in the Entertainment and Technology Department right here at CUNY City Tech. Heidi is here today to detail her development building Limbic Labs. I'd like to have everybody give a warm welcome to Heidi Bober. Hello. Good hey, Jessica. <laughs> Um, before I begin, um, Justin asked me to say a little bit about City Tech and the program that I run. And as I was sitting in the audience, it reminded me a bit of a story. Um, so I, I attended my first uh, honors convocation this year at City Tech, and I sat right over there with my colleagues. And uh, the provost actually asked all of the students who were attending um, how many students came from another country, were born in another country, or whose parents came from another country and spoke a different language at home. And nearly every student in the room stood up. Um, it was very moving, and um, it reminded me why I have chosen to work in an institution like City Tech and public education. Um, so one of the things I want to to share, as I was saying there, I jotted a couple of questions down also for the audience, um, because my, con my colleagues and I continually ask ourselves how we can prepare our students uh, to be relevant and competitive in this rapidly changing industry for jobs that may not yet exist and with the limited resources we have. Um, the second thing we ask ourselves oftentimes is what small role can we play in diversifying the tech industry? by connecting our students to networks, jobs, and internships that are meaningful. Um, so before I actually jump into my talk, which is drastically different than what I'm asking you, um, I just want to pose a couple of questions to see how you might ponder them you know, over the course of the conference. Um, so the first one is, beyond hiring and retention, how are you designing for diversity in your startup corporation, nonprofit, or academic institution. Second, what are your blind spots? And then the last one is, what systems and processes do you need to change so that my students, who are aspiring game designers, software engineers, hardware developers, and musical technologists, um, can grow into positions of leadership and power? So. We have a lot of work to do around kind of pipeline issues, so I just kind of want to throw that out here just because of the type of audience that is sitting in the room today. Um, so now I'm going to kind of make a radical departure and kind of share what else is keeping me up at night, um, which is this, the ethics of button pushing. So. Um, so for the past 15 years, I've been harnessing pop culture and emerging technology to shift cultural norms. I've made video games to promote human rights. I've made animations to raise awareness about unfair immigration laws. And I've even made location-based augmented reality apps to change perceptions around homelessness well before Pokemon Go. But then I began to wonder whether a game or an app can really change attitudes and behaviors, and if so, can I measure that change, and what's the science behind that process? So I shifted my focus from making media and technology to measuring their neurobiological effects. Here's what I discovered. The web, mobile devices, virtual and augmented reality are a slow form of violence Rescripting our nervous systems, and they are literally changing the structure of our brains. The very technologies I had been using to positively influence hearts and minds were actually eroding functions in the brain necessary for empathy and decision making. In fact, 
our dependence upon the web and mobile devices might be taking over our cognitive and affective faculties, rendering us socially and emotionally incompetent, and I felt somehow complicit in this dehumanization. So I realized that I, before I could continue making media about social issues, I needed to reverse engineer the harmful effects of technology. To tackle this, I first turned to multimedia performance generated from dancers' nervous systems using biophysical sensors that I built in an attempt to restore critical feeling by reconnecting us to our bodies and to one another. But then I began to dig deeper. I asked myself, how can I translate the mechanisms of empathy, the cognitive, affective, and motivational aspects into an engine that simulates the narrative ingredients that move us to act? Inspired by the British cyberneticist, I decided to build a machine to answer this. So, um, for the past several years, I've been developing an open source biometric lab, an AI system, which I call the Limbic Lab. The lab not only captures the brain and body's unconscious response to media and technology, but also uses machine learning to adapt content based on these biological responses. My goal is to find out what combination of narrative ingredients are the most appealing and galvanizing to specific target audiences so that I can enable social justice, cultural, and educational organizations to create more effective media. The Limbic Lab now consists of two components, a narrative engine and a media machine. The narrative engine takes in and syncs real-time data from brainwaves, biophysical data like heart rate, blood flow, body temperature, and muscle contraction, as well as eye tracking and facial recognition, while a subject is viewing or interacting with media content. Data is captured, however, at key places where critical plot points, character interaction, or unusual camera angles occur. Like in Game of Thrones' Red Wedding when, shockingly, everybody dies. Um, so then what I do is take survey data on that person's political beliefs along with their psychographic and demographic profiles, and these are integrated into the system to gain a deeper understanding of the individual. Let me give you an example. Matching people's TV preferences with their views on social justice issues reveal that Americans who rank immigration among their top three concerns are more likely to be fans of The Walking Dead. <laughs> and they often watch for the adrenaline boost, which is measurable. So each person's biological signature and survey responses combine to create their unique media imprint, which is stored in a database. Then our predictive model finds patterns between imprints and tells me which narrative ingredients are more likely to lead to engagement and altruistic behavior rather than distress and apathy. The more imprints added to the database across mediums from episodic television to games, the better the predictive models become, the more nuanced. In short, I am mapping the first media genome. Whereas the human, human genome identifies all genes involved in sequencing human DNA, the growing database of media imprints will eventually allow me to determine the media DNA for a specific individual. Already, the Limbic Lab's narrative engine enables content creators to refine their storytelling so that it affects their intended audiences at an individual level. The Limbic Lab's other component, the media machine, will assess how media elicits an emotional and physiological response, then pulls scenes from a content library targeted to person-specific media DNA. Applying artificial intelligence to biometric data creates a truly personalized experience, one that will adapt real time to the viewer's unconscious responses. So imagine if nonprofits and media makers were able to measure how audiences feel as they experience it 
and alter content on the fly. I believe this is the future of media, or at least one version of it. To date, most media and social change strategies have attempted to appeal to ma mass audiences, but the future is media customized for each person. As real-time measurement of media consumption and automated media production become the norm, we will soon be consuming media tailored directly to our cravings using a blend of psychographics, biometrics, and AI. It's like personalized medicine based on our DNA. I call it biomedia. I'm currently testing the Limbic Lab in a pilot study, which looks at the top 50 episodic television shows in collaboration with the Norman Lear Center and funded by the Pop Culture Collaborative. But I'm grappling with an ethical dilemma. If you design a tool that can be turned into a weapon, should you build it? By open sourcing the lab to encourage access and inclusivity, I also run the risk of enabling powerful governments and profit-driven companies to appropriate the platform for fake news, marketing, or other forms of mass persuasion. For me, therefore, it is critical to make my research as transparent to lay audiences as GMO labels. However, I'm aware that this is obviously not enough. So as creative technologists, we have a responsibility not only to reflect upon how present technology shapes our cultural values and social behaviors, but also to actively challenge the trajectory of future technology. It's my hope that we make an ethical commitment to harvesting the body's intelligence for the creation of authentic and just stories that transform media and technology from harmful weapons into narrative medicine. Thank you.